Imagining modernity. There was a wonderful comparison between um, Valentine Gunasekara and Bauer in the way of uh, Valentine being uh, critical in a sense, and Bauer being well, Bauer's work being more picturesque. How do you feel about about the the experience of their buildings, where Valentine's buildings touch your mind, but don't necessarily touch your heart? And Bauer's buildings touch your heart, but don't necessarily touch your mind. Would you say Valentine struggled with that uh, uh, to a degree as well? Uh, and, and because a lot of his forms don't necessarily feel comfortable with each other as well. And it feels, on the one hand, spatially, he addresses very, very pertinent issues with respect to modernity, but fails to address those are the issues that touch the heart, which Bauer does so well. But whose heart? The question is whose heart? So if you are someone who poor villager who grew up in a mud hut, would you look at Baba's architecture and say, this is like the manorial residence of that village chieftain who oppressed me? Or are you going to say, oh, this is like a version of my mud hut? So you have to ask the question, who? So, it's, it's, so your question has to do with what one's aspirations are, as opposed to what an architect Attempts. I think Baba's sensibility is not universal. Definitely not. But yeah. definitely not. But the whole issue then is it's all dependent on the perceiver rather than the Of course. Yeah. So Baba is designing for a particular group of people who will understand that aesthetic and will actually, you know, be invigorated by it. But I know many, many underprivileged people who love his buildings too. And I know many who also hate. So Just as I know many privileged people who hate his buildings too. Yes. So you can't. <laughs> so it's a tough, it's a tough so one, it's isn't a tough it? One. But I want to clarify that I have no problem with Baba's architecture from an aesthetic point of view. I think it's a beautiful architecture. I think it has been overly written in terms of the vernacular and regionalism and hasn't been explored in terms of the phenomenological experience, which is what is very critical yeah. about it. Yeah. It's not its, its actual representation, it's the experience. And the reason why nobody writes about it in that way is because they want to advance him as a Sri Lankan architecture. They want to show him creating a formula, which I don't think he ever did. So discourses also produce architects in particular ways. But the reason I wrote the Valentine book was because I was getting sick of the number of books that were written on Jeffrey Bauer. <laughs> so by the time like the fifth book was coming out, I was like, let's write what somebody else. And you know, it was a provocative thing to do and created a lot of controversy and trouble for me. For but, good, but for good reason, I think. But I think it was important to have a picture of Sri Lanka as not being, you know, completely subsumed by one aesthetic, that there were other spaces and other aesthetics. Now, we are currently looking, again, there are huge problems in my lecture, which I was hoping you would point out. But one of the problems is the MIMA discourse produces a discussion on a particular type of architecture and a particular type of architect. And this is, of course, aesthetically driven. 
These are what we call good designers. But the work of architecture is far broader than that. Even your government architect is designing an architecture that is very important and useful. Your infrastructure and the buildings that support it are so important for your cities. If you really ask who is building your cities around you and who has enabled you to have your life, they're not necessarily these privileged architects. They're a host of anonymous people who have worked together to different levels of aesthetic completion and compromise to produce the environments you live in. But they will never get written about because nobody will buy the books. So this is something that you need to also you know, understand. Town planners, yeah, as well. Town planners are part of it. So, you know, architects, town planners, landscape designers, everybody wants to be that person upon whom the monograph is written. But, you know, everybody does something that is useful in the end. It's just that the avenue to achieve that success is available for a few people with a particular kind of focus and maybe background, maybe opportunities, maybe exposure. And even very talented people may not have that and so never achieve that height. <coughs> so we need to be very wary about whom we celebrate and why we celebrate them. But we need to be more wary of celebrating them because they are recognized by the West you know, purely for that reason. Because then what we'll do is we'll just produce something that fits into a discourse. And this is what I'm saying, the tropical architecture discourse, the re critical regionalist discourse. These are coming from outside and we are applying it to our architecture. When we produce a regionalist discourse long before that. So why are we forgetting this and embracing that? Why is it so important for us to have this thing imposed on us? From Kenneth Frampton, historian, you know, in Columbia University, <laughs> and not, you know, a group of people who had an Arthur Khan seminar in 1984. Whose voice do you want to hear? So the question is quite simple. You want to hear a voice that is yours. Produce that voice. Educate a generation to write. Create research programs. M fields in research, which are coastal research programs. There are none like this in Asia. Produce PhD programs, which are coursework PhD programs, just like you have in the West. And you have an entire generation of people who write critically and write well about your architecture. And you won't have just five books on one person, you will have you know, 50 books on 50. That's what you need. Written from inside with people who know the language and can write the books, intimately understanding the circumstances and the context. And I mean, it's what we try to do. Like, I mean, I, I was just saying earlier today, three of my best students in the class I taught recently were Malaysians. They all got scores between 80 to 100. Excellent essays. This is at the University of Melbourne. And this is the first time they were exposed to critical writing or you know, thinking. And they came on top. So there is no problem there. If you create the opportunities for them to come back to Malaysia and they don't get sucked into the good life in Australia, <laughs> they'll be right to them. So, I mean, if you're like involved with the institute and you have some understanding of what the Malaysian scene in architecture, make sure that these young people have opportunities. Make sure there are competitions that will give them that, that chance. Make sure that you are always running to foreigners for the books you write about yourselves. And give your own people your voice. Yeah? And do that. And then, you know, you can reclaim that space that you are already had in 1980. You already had it. You were like the foremost voice in this whole discourse. And we were looking, you know, 